The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Almighty God, we thank and praise you for this day when we can get together as family and gather around your word. Uh, grant that you would, by your spirit, through your means of grace, uh, especially your word, uh, teach us in all wisdom and understanding that we may know the right faith, the true faith, the right doctrine to share with others. We ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Um, we're moving in our textbook into the appendix on the Lutheran confessions. Um, I also uh, mentioned last week if you would bring uh, your book of Concord so that I could show you what is confessional subscription. Uh, that's important. Uh, and you'll find that on Roman numeral 28 and Roman numeral 29 in the very front um, of your, uh, well, close to the very front of your um, Book of Concord, and we'll do that in a minute. We'll start. We'll start with your blue textbook. Um, the appendix is on page 485, although that number doesn't show. It's but it shows 486 on the next page. Uh, we'll begin with justification as the cornerstone of Christian doctrine. Uh, we'll move into what are creeds and confessions, and then we'll come to confessional subscription. What is it? Um, in your book of Concord at the start. Because it's really important. As a member of Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church and School, um, you subscribe to um, the, uh, the, the 1580 unaltered you know, book of uh, Augsburg Confession, the book of Concord, 1580. What is that? What does that even mean? And, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that from what's written here in the book of Concord. But let's begin with your appendix. The textbook, as we've been saying, is I'm called to believe, teach, and confess. Uh, an introduction to doctrinal theology. It's just a summary. We're not going uh, into every aspect of every topic, uh, but rather touching on some core things that we'll do in, uh, in more depth um, later. So the appendix says uh, justification is the heart of the Christian doctrine, uh, and that is a point-blank truth. And in fact, if you dig through um, for example, the, the, the theology of even other denominations, ultimately you will find where they err in some way comes back to is justification the cornerstone or not um, of, of their doctrine? Uh, is it the material principle? And for review, remember we talked about formal and material principles. The formal principle of any religion is its source of authority. The material principle of any religion is its central point. So for Lutherans, the formal principle of our theology is Scripture alone. For uh, Lutherans, the material principle is justification um, by faith alone. So um, that's just kind of a quick uh, zoom through kind of basis for why we're even talking about confessions and why uh, we will be talking about denominations um, kind of in the future there, returning to that. So from the beginning, Christians have formulated scriptural summaries as statements of their beliefs, these statements are known as creeds or confessions. Those words show in bold print um, in your appendix there. They proclaim the core beliefs and values. In fact, the word creed comes from the Latin credo. It means I believe, and it's the opening word of uh, the, uh, the Apostles' Creed in um, Latin, I believe. Uh, let's turn to page 486 and go into the nature of confessions. Okay, The New Testament word for confess is Amalagain. That's Greek, um, but it's written in English letters there. It literally means the same words. Okay, so a person who makes a confession sames, says the same words as another, agreeing that these words are correct. That's a great way to put that. Um, a confession is confessing the same words as another person and, and agreeing together these words are correct. Notice the togetherness, togetherness of a confession. Um, that's uh, critical to the understanding of, of what is the point of us having a confession. We together um, subscribe to um, the, the 1580 Book of Concord um, and what is contained therein uh, as a true exposition of Scripture. We'll get into that some more in a little bit. But to confess, uh, as a Lutheran, is to confess together. Uh, it's not this um, me and my Jesus kind of idea, um, I'm this isolated island doing my thing, sort of like a modern day um, you know, monastic, but rather I'm part of this larger thing, I'm part of the body of Christ, and together 
we confess in full unity. And we have unity because we confess together, not because we pay a vague lip ser service to a word called unity, but we actually um, have the substance of unity by confessing the same thing. Together we confess we're sinners, 1 John 1, 9. All right? We confess that Jesus is Lord, Romans 10, 9. Okay? Um, we uh, note uh, Paul speaks in Timothy about uh, making his good confession in the presence of many witnesses and notes that Jesus made the good confession before Pilate, 1 Timothy 6, 12, and, and 13. Um, we can say a lot of things, but to confess is to profess truth. And, and along with that, um, fundamental to that is the understanding that there is truth and that, that it's this objective thing, that it is not a matter of personal opinion or subject to the, the vagaries of cultural norms, which blow in the wind. Um, fads come and go. We talked recently, as a matter of fact, I used examples in a recent sermon uh, about, uh, you know, the pet rock, you know, and um, then there was, you know, Furbies and Beanie Babies and Cabbage Patch Kids and Fidget Spinners and these things come and go. Bell Bottoms <laughs> came and went and may they stay went. <laughs> uh, you know, um, Afros were a thing in the early 70s. And I confess, uh, even in the late 70s, that yes, I went out with my friends, and when I had hair, I got it curly. Yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, my mom thought that was really neat and keeps a picture of that and shows friends to my utter embarrassment all the time. Yeah. So these things come and go, um, but a confession is a statement of objective, timeless truth. It doesn't change. It's true not because I feel like it's true, not because it confirms my bias, not because it sounds pleasing to my ear. It's true because it's true. Uh, I once heard, and this has really been a helpful guide to me, about just the term confession. <clears throat> and I think a lot of people tend to think of like uh, confessing a crime or confessing sins or things like that. Yeah. But confession, like you say, is saying back through Scripture what God has already told us. We of ourselves don't come up with our own truth that we yeah. speak through That's this. Right. We are simply repeating back to God what he says to us throughout the, entire, the entirety of, of Holy Scripture. He says... Um, I made you. Yes, you made me. Yeah. Uh, you are a sinner. Yes, I am a sinner. Yeah. Um, and I have found that also to be really instructive in terms of like the gift of faith. You know, we are given the gift of faith to confess back to God what He has said to us, to to read or to hear through the ear the, that you know the, the law and the gospel, and to say yes, I, I understand and, and I agree with you, God. And and that to me has been has been uh, really helpful, especially in in terms of you know as Lutherans uh, we talk about sola scriptura. We don't have to worry about this truth coming from anywhere else because it's been revealed to us through special revelation. God has given it to us so that we can confess it back to Him because without Him saying it to us first. We, we wouldn't have anything to say other than selfish things. Right, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Yeah. Confession is a written formal statement by which an individual Christian or group of Christians publicly declares to others what they believe. See, membership in a church is a public statement of faith. It says, I believe and confess what is believed and confessed at this altar. That's why we practice closed communion. Because we don't just dish that out willy-nilly to anyone. It's a matter of pastoral care as well as um, just simply following the commands and exhortations of Scripture about the practice. But the point is, is that when you commune at an altar, you're making a statement of faith. I believe what is taught here. I have, um, uh, I have uh, absolute agreement with and unity with the content of what is believed, taught, and confessed here. You know, I don't commune there because I don't have fellowship with that. I have fellowship with this, with this here. Um, and that's a really, really, really important thing. Communion is not a matter of hospitality. Um, it is um, not only, not only <laughs> our statement of what we believe, teach, and confess, our, our unity with that, but is the thing that makes us that um, communion of saints and, and that body and gives us that, that unity, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10. So um, a confession is a huge deal. It, it's, an, it's an enormous deal. And... Um, Thank God. I'm just so happy um, that recent uh, visitors uh, whom, whom we've had have kind of just shown up um, from so, some other denominations. S somehow, all of a sudden, we're, we're getting visitors who get it, 
who are like who di who don't come and insist on communion, don't act angry that we practice closed communion, but rather say, no, I understand. Uh, there are things that I need to know and be able to confess in order to commune with this fellowship and know that I have unity. Here I get it. What are those things? Wow, <laughs> that's pretty cool. We've had a run of that lately over the past couple of months. It's wow, it's pretty, pretty awesome, pretty awesome. Uh, the unifying nature of confessions is next in your textbook. On 487, a confession may show the nature of what different groups believe and can clearly distinguish between different teachings and understandings. The reason why denominations exist is because we don't all believe the same thing. Um, I had the opportunity re recently to witness uh, to someone um, who, who is, uh, I mean, well, um, the, the gentleman who, who uh, rents space to us out of the theater in Spanish Fork for our mission um, was a Latter-day Saint and kind of just is sort of exploring or, you know, he's kind of, and he, um, for all intents and purposes, uh, he believes in Jesus Christ. He's just kind of working, okay, what is that? What does that mean and how do we flesh this out? Um, I love it because it sort of reminds me of Augustine, I believe that I may know. <clears throat> you know, versus Aquinas, I know that I may believe. No, that's the magisterial use of reason. His is ministerial. Yeah, I believe and I want to know. So, at any rate, um, when we were having this movie event yesterday, um, we wanted to know, should I, I, I put, you know, I've made a Facebook event, you guys are the host, uh, we're the host, we're, we're making a community event, should I make the, the morning church also a host? There's a non-denominational rock and roll church that these kids have in the morning, and he wanted to know, can they co-host the movie also? And so I'm like, oh, okay, what do you do? How do you not? Here you go, right? Here you go. Before we ever got to, to point A, we're at point Q, you know, and we're leapfrogging a bunch of stuff. So I tried it, and it seemed to work, to explain to him. There may be some people who, who teach that 1 plus 1 is 2, and there may be others that teach 1 plus 1 is 1, or even 0.5, or that, or, or that it's 3. And rather than just say, what does it matter, it's all math. You know, we have to realize that it does matter, especially, for example, if it would impact your paycheck, <laughs> matter, taxes, right, uh, and other, it, it does matter. Um, and, and so we, we can't, until we have the opportunity to speak to this other group and talk about what is believed, taught, and confessed, and come together, try to come together. We can't just throw people in there who may think one plus one is one, or point five, or three, because that would confuse the, uh, the, uh, give a confusing public witness about what we're about and what we teach. And he totally got it. He's like, oh, okay, I understand. I got it, thanks. He's like, really? <laughs> you didn't get angry and storm off? <laughs> yes. <laughs> How dare you awesome. assign a name to that number? Who are you to, you know? Yeah, yeah right, 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 right. How dare you say one plus one that is two? That may be your truth. Yes. Right, right, right. right. It's about my truth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to comment too. Uh, I don't think it goes into this. I mean, you know, we talk about the nature of, of um, the, the the confession and, and kind of what it's like to have a book of con. We haven't really talked about it yet, the book of Concord. But you'll you'll run into folks who are like, well, I don't need that. I just have the Bible. Well, okay, well we have that too. But then you'll say, well, how do you understand the Bible? And they'll say, well, here are all these books I got at the Christian bookstore. And they'll have, you know, Joel Osteen or whatever, and they'll just pull things out. And they're like, oh, this, this guy, you know, who's on TV, I listen to this, uh, you know, yeah. dispensationalist, whatever. The, the idea of, of having a, <clears throat> an exposition on Scripture is so that we can all be on the same page. There's something very practically useful and being able to say, well, how do we understand that? Because it might be different than the way you understand that. Let's figure out where that is. And that's that's what we have through the Book of Concord. Because without that, you have churches that are kind of loosey-goosey, like, man, we're not about religion. We're just about Jesus. And it's like, okay, just like you said, okay, well, what do you mean by that? Because you might mean something different than what we mean by that. And, it, and it's funny, there are people who will attack the idea of even having confessional documents or, or foundational documents for the Lutheran confession, but then they'll pull something out from somewhere else anyway, and you've just got something that's kind of, like I said, loosey-goosey that comes from who knows where. So there's a very practical application to having confessional subscription as well. Yeah, and to use kind of a secular analogy... You know, we have a constitution and a bill of rights to say what an American is, what, what's a citizen of America. And you can't just, uh, uh, I'm going to be careful here. You can't just <laughs> pop in from somewhere else and demand to have the rights and privileges under this constitution that specifies what a citizen is when you don't have that. Ha, okay, that just needs to stay right there like that. And, uh, just use corporate charter. 
Yeah. Uh, actually, a corporate, corporate charter. charter. Right. Uh, right. Right. And, and companies, <laughs> have, yeah. and companies have corporate <laughs> charters to establish the boundaries of what is the corporation. And, and actually, Pastor, on that on that comment about the Constitution, that's a great example because, for example, the word Trinity does not appear in Scripture, right? It had to come from somewhere. In our U.S. Constitution, we don't have terms like checks and balances or judicial review. It's just that's the process that is identified in those documents, and that's the name that we give to this process that is that is defined. And so there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing weird about having confessional documents. It, it's just the, as we would say, the truest exposition of Scripture and, and you know, you know, I, and I think I've said this before in this class, is that we understand that Scripture itself is infallible and can only be infallible, and, and we just say that, that the Book of Concord simply does not, uh, does not turn out fallible. You yeah, know? and actually we're going to go to that, right, how, about the, the, the norm, uh, the norming norm and the norm that is normed. We're going to talk about that actually in a, in a we, little bit. Pastor, we don't, so, we, don't, yeah. we don't say truest, we say true. True. Yeah. So it's not well, it's the best possible one. That's not what we say. We say it is true. Yeah, it's true. I see what you said. Yeah, I see what you mean. Right. It's not the closest approximation. It's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I get in trouble uh, from time to time for saying that, I'm not, and I'm okay with that. Um, it's just sad. But it, how would you have the audacity to say that this one thing is true? Well, I don't know. I mean, we do that a lot. We say one plus one is two. We have the audacity to say that. But that is the confession we make. Yeah. I mean, it's in our... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So, and, um, yeah. So, and uh, more on that in a minute. Seeking oneness, uh, your book says, by external union without doctrinal agreement is called unity. Well, it's called unity by the culture, you know. Um, so I want to be careful there because there is a real unity, and the real unity is doctrinal agreement. Uh, is not lip service to an external agreement, you know, kind of like um, the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification between the ELCA and the Roman Catholic theologians that, that trounced them without them realizing it. Um, we will say, you know, we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ as long as we don't define the terms. And um, that's that's just it's, at that point. What what is the point? What what is what is the point of that kind of you know unity? The second approach to divisions is called concord. In Latin, concordia, the word literally means from the heart. Okay, those who seek this type of solution to divisions would say that simply pretending to agree with others or agreeing to disagree is a mockery of unity. That's straight up true. <laughs> that's just true. Um, Christians should constantly strive for a common confession of faith, concord, but that this uh, concord then leads to outward unity. That's why when visitors come, we ask them, please don't commune until you've had a chance to speak with pastor and an opportunity to learn what we believe, teach, and confess so that you can have the information you need to make an informed decision. Yes, oh, that's what I also believe, teach, and confess. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, and so we do, we sit down with the small catechism and we go through the six chief parts and, and people have come to us even recently um, from Methodist and Presbyterian and other backgrounds and said, yeah, actually, all along that's what I believed in. I didn't even know that, you know, and they've been able to join the fellowship. So um, that is a big deal. Um, otherwise, really, really outside of that, all you have is a farce. You know, you have a, a mockery. Yeah. Yeah. On 488, Confessional Lutheranism believes that the Word of God is supreme to all other sources. I mentioned that we would get to the norming norm. Uh, so uh, something that is a norm is, is kind of the rule or the guide by which everything else is, is to be judged. So the, to say that Scripture is the, the norming norm, it's the ultimate authority. There, there's no higher authority. There's just not. Um, everything that we believe, teach, and confess um, is uh, subject to that Holy Scripture. The Book of Concord itself, as an exposition of Scripture, true exposition, is subject to Holy Scripture. So you have sort of this hierarchy of, 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 of confessional expression. You have Scripture is the norming norm. Norming norm. Okay. That's Scripture. 
And when we say scripture, we mean the Bible. What part of the Bible is um, divine inspired, inerrant, and so forth? Just the part between the covers. Yeah. From Genesis to Revelation. Yeah, the norming norm is scripture. The norm that is normed, those are our confessions. So what we are saying is that the, the Lutheran confessions are our clear statement of what we believe that is governed by Scripture as the highest authority. Yeah. Okay. We would not say the confessions are divine, inspired, inerrant. We would say the Bible is. We subscribe to the confessions because they are a true exposition of Scripture. And that's so important that it, it points back to the ultimate authority. Yeah. Yes? I mean, when we make that confession as new members or... Uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> when we say it's a true exposition, Yeah. I mean, that troubles me because it's, it seems to be saying... It can't possibly have any errors. I'm saying this is without error. So I, I would say it's the best. I I am in agreement with it. I mean all of those things, but Right. So the reality is that that that's not so good. One marker plus one marker is two. That's the reality and the governing authority of this. I just wrote this. That's a true exposition of this. That doesn't mean I'm without error. It means it's telling the truth about this. That's what we're trying to say about Scripture. Okay, but I mean, this, what you're showing us now, doesn't seem to be equal to the confession that we make as. Why is that? LCMS. I mean, help me understand is what because I mean. Because you have now put this below Scripture and saying... Yes. I, I mean, I know that inherently that it's that's the case. Yeah. But why do we make, why do we make that confession that this is true? I mean, why, why can't we say it is... Because we don't want to say what we believe is false. Because that wouldn't make sense. No, you wouldn't have to say it's false. You could say... Then you can only say it's true. You could say it's the best or the most accurate or... I place, I mean, to me it seems like it is offending scripture by placing it on the same footing. It's, it's, oh, no, it's not on the same footing. Okay. We just said that. That's what this actually means is that it's not on the same footing. Yeah. So the norm, I get it, though, I get it. The norming norm is scripture, the ultimate authority. This is, gov this is governed by scripture. Yeah. So that any point where we define that, uh oh, somehow we missed a spot or whatever, this would have to be changed and according would, to that. And as LCMS, we would be okay with that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I, I just You'd to, have to because <clears throat> this is the ultimate authority. Yeah, yeah just, just to jump in on that, Mark. So I think uh, the, way, the way that I understand it, I mean, I, I do understand that we would say, yeah, the, I, I've never really heard it said that we would say, well, the, the Book of Concord is inerrant. I mean, we could say, well, no, no, if you could show that. us somewhere, like we're open to the idea that something's wrong, but yeah. there's just not really any way that it could be. But, but, if, but if you but we're open to that idea. Seeing that incorrectness would be back to Scripture. Right, so correct. Scripture J ju just, scripture just like Martin yeah. Luther at the Deed of Worms. If you, can, yeah. if you can provide from Scripture some place that shows that some component of the Book of Concord errs, yeah. We're open to that, yeah, but yeah. it's just not real likely at this point. Yeah, we're saying we've been through it frontwards and backwards, and we believe it's a true exposition of Scripture. But if you find something, show us. But show us by this, because yeah. um, by human reason will not be good enough. Yeah. But but by this it would, yeah. yeah. Don't come up with the Book of Mormon and go, yeah. see, that's wrong. <laughs> yeah, even, even the Apostles' Creed, we would say, that's true. But it's not Scripture. Because to say something is divine, <clears throat> inspired, is, yeah. it's, of course it's true, but this is divine and inspired and this isn't because those aren't, those are um, sets that do intersect, but they're not contiguous. They're, I mean, not, they're not um, identical. 
sets. Yeah. And, and I would say just as a, as a thought exercise, theoretically you could have some secret enclave of society out there somewhere that independently came up with their own confessional book that could be equal or could state things equally like the components of the Book of Concord do. And we could point at that and say, oh, yeah, yeah, we agree on all of this stuff. Theoretically, you came up with something else that was also the truest exposition possible of Scripture. So this is true, but I'm not divine. And, and somebody else could make that same statement and also be equally true, but it's not by that exposition that it is true. It's, it's an exposition of something that is already true. Okay, yeah, because the reality does that, does that make sense? True. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah they're not. Yeah. Yeah, these aren't, these aren't <laughs> completely equal. They intersect, but they're not completely equal. Yeah. Yeah. But see, it's great, great, great to have that discussion. Great because otherwise, somebody's scratching out there and saying, oh man, why are we even talking about this? Why don't we just only have the Bible? And that happens. There are entire denominations that will say, we have no creed. You know, we don't believe in creeds. That's a creed, by the way. But, but we also need to focus in on this because we don't want to be Gnostics, right? We don't want to be able to establish our own truth and claim the divinity from our own heads, right? That's right. So it must, that divine inspiration must be the book. Yeah. Um, and then anything else is just how we... Yeah. How we, we understand and, and find the truth there. Yeah, the Apostles' Creed is true, but not divine, inspired, inerrant. It's not, it's not the Bible. It's not the inspired word of God. But it's true. Um, and um, so is the Nicene Creed. So is the Athanasian Creed. Those are all true. But they're, they're true not because we've decided that, but because they just say what Scripture says. <coughs> yeah. Saying that. Yeah. Yeah, if we, if we ever um, found, and you know, believe me, people have tried, <laughs> you know, done whole dissertations on phrases and stuff, um, have tried. Um, so far, so good. But if it ever had to change to fit this, it would have to change. It's subordinate. Yeah, to scripture, yeah. Yeah, it would totally have to change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. That's an important, important discussion to have. Fantastic. Um, we mentioned creeds. Let's go to the ecumenical creeds on 489. Uh, ecumenical means worldwide or universal. Um, in the day, an ecumenical, um, for example, council was a meeting of the whole church or the representatives of the whole church. Ecumenical, especially since about the 60s or so, has come to mean more of a smurfy, external unity kind of a thing, um, agreeing to disagree uh, kind of stuff. The doctrine presented in the creeds separates Christians from non-Christians. That's pretty intense, that statement, but it's true. Um, yeah, let's do that again. The doctrine presented in the creeds separates Christians from non-Christians. So, one of the most basic components of Christian faith, um, as a qualifier, is Trinity. Okay? Um, again, that word uh, does not appear itself in Scripture, um, neither does the word Toyota, but Toyotas exist, and it, that word describes those things that we call Toyotas. Um, Trinity is a word that describes um, the, 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 the persons, the three persons in one Godhead, same substance, and yet unique persons. Um, it describes that um, reality. Yeah. Um, there are other words also that aren't in Scripture, like uh, chasuble. You know? um, so, Advent, no, uh, well, depends on which translation, mm -hmm. but you get the idea. Yeah. All right, the Apostles' Creed. Um, your book says... Um, and again, this is just a summary, a flyby. This isn't trying to go into ultimate depth on every topic. Uh, there's no way to do that in this context. Um, this, the Apostles' Creed was first uh, referred to by that name in AD 390, but the Creed is far older than that. In the latter half of the second century, an early version now known as the Old Roman Symbol, um, we've also, it's also called the Regula Fide, the Rule of Faith, was used in Christian congregations. That's a baptismal formula. Uh, and they were asked to confess faith in a triune God, even as they you know, would be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
So faith that is not Trinitarian faith is not Christian faith. Um, and so we would not be thinking only in terms of our immediate mission context, the Latter-day Saints. Uh, but uh, here's another example, Unitarians, right? Um, that's denying um, kind of your, f al almost, almost your first hurdle, you know, in, in doctrinal points in Christian faith. Um, it, it's, Christian faith is Trinitarian. Your book mentions uh, the Arian controversy and the development of the Nicene Creed. This is so important. This is such a big deal to know who Arius was and what that was about. Um, Arius was a, um, a supervising pastor, I believe, in uh, Alexandria. Um, lived right about 250 um, to, uh, here, your book says 256 to 336. Um, he was so concerned with upholding the sovereignty and deity of the Father that he subordinated the Son. Um, he said the Son was not fully God. That there was a time when the Son was not. The Son is a created being that is lesser than the Father. He's a God, but not the God. Okay? Um, so uh, Arianism um, subordinates Christ to the Father. And, th and that sort of thing... Um, keeps cropping up its ugly head even today. It was a huge problem for the church in the, uh, the, the latter 200s, early 300s, through the 400s. Um, the Nicene Creed and then subsequent to that, the Athanasian Creed um, put a pretty good dent in Arianism, which sort of faded and then came roaring back um, later uh, and shows up today in things in theology like uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Latter-day Saints, and so forth. Um, Subordinating the Son to the Father, but even, even in some mainline Christian denominations, for example, uh, the belief that Christ cannot be really present in with and under the elements of bread and wine received in the mouth in Holy Communion is a form of Arianism without, real, without the people realizing that it's a form of Arianism. The Son there is subordinate to the Father and is not of the same substance of the Father because the Father is omnipotent and omnipresent and the Son can be neither if he cannot be present in communion because his body restricts him in locus, uh, in a particular place um, in heaven. That makes him less, less than the Father. Uh, it's also creating an imaginary fourth genus, a genus canonicum, uh, where the, um, the characteristics of his humanity restrict um, his divinity. Um, and let me, let me just for quick review, when I'm talking about uh, the idiomatica, the genus... Um, idiomaticum. These, these are just um, Lutheran scholastic expressions of the theology of Christ. I'll, I'll come to the question in just a second. I'm going to plug in these three. The idiomaticum is, um, is that we can refer to Christ um, by idiom, which isn't super helpful. But we, it's okay to say of Christ um, that he was tired, he was hungry, he was uh, sleepy, he was in pain, he suffered, he wept according to his human nature. It's okay to say he walked on water, raised the dead, healed the sick according to his divine nature. It's okay to talk about him um, in, in idioms as long as we understand we're not reducing um, his, his divinity. The genus apa telismaticum. Um, says that, that whenever we talk about Christ and what he's doing, whether according to the human or divine nature, the whole Christ is doing and is doing for your salvation. So there's a goal, an end point, a, a, a telos, a point to what he's doing, and he's doing it for your salvation. And then the gainus. Myostaticum. Um, it is really the majesty of divinity. You know. Uh, in other words, um, the divinity of Christ communicated its attributes through his humanity, but, but not the reverse. The humanity doesn't block uh, the divinity. This is where they go wrong. Um, the sacramentarians go wrong in denying the real presence of Christ in the sacrament, at the altar, received in the mouth with the elements. Um, 
by saying, well, his body kind of restricts him in locus. He's at the right hand of the Father. He can't be there. Uh, this is because you've got this messed up, and you've gone with this canonicum, a kind of a fourth imaginary genus canonicum, where the humanity blocks the divinity uh, from, from being there. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm maybe going too fast. Am I muddling this? Yeah, can I comment? Because I actually just wanted to, to kind of describe this type of thing is exactly why a book of Concord exists, is because all, all this really is, is this is a bunch of theologians over the course of the last 2,000 years figuring out, well, who is Jesus and how does he work? And, and it's not that they sat down first and were like, I'm going to create this weird bunch of Latin words and, and figure this right. out, but it's more like, well, in the, in, in, the, in the account of Jesus walking on water, a normal person couldn't do that, but a divine person could. Right. And, you know, uh, if, if Jesus is God and man, as it says in Scripture, well, then what does it mean when he, when he died on the cross? Because uh, a human person could die, but a divine person couldn't. So, so wait, but he did, but... And so, and so it's all that stuff is, and, and a bunch of smarter people than me and you wrote, argued about it over the course of the last 2,000 years, wrote it down, related it back to Scripture, and said, well, here's why we say this, because this is what Scripture says. And so then we therefore have the idea of the gain eye, which basically just says, well, how do we understand Christ? So that if somebody else says, well, you know... The Father is a different person than the Son, and he conceived him up in heaven and then created him. We can say, well, that's not actually what Scripture says, because, right. because this is how we understand it. Right. And, and these are just the names for those things. And they're, and they're kind of tricky and complicated at first, but once you understand kind of what each one is, it's not yeah. as big a deal. Yeah, yeah. And um, messing up this in particular um, you know, is... is um, where the modern day Aryans come from, Jesus, it, 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 and it's and remember, there's a great line I want to um, see if I can find real quick for you in here uh, about who who are we talking to? It's I think in the introduction, in the original preface. There it is. Uh, this shows on page nine. You might want to underline this uh, on page nine in your book of Concord. Um, See in the left column where it says the number 20 in that section, and then go down three, four sentences where it says, so it is not at all our plan and purpose to condemn people who err because of a certain simplicity of mind, but are not blasphemers against the truth of the heavenly doctrine. Much less indeed do we intend to condemn entire churches that are either under the Roman Empire or of the German nation or elsewhere, Rather, it has been our intention and desire in this way to openly criticize and condemn only the fanatical opinions and their stubborn and blasphemous teachers. So the two things to underline, the first sense, so it is not at all our plan and purpose to condemn people who err because of a certain simplicity of mind, but are not blasphemers against the truth of heavenly doctrine. The second sentence is, rather it has been our intention and desire in this way to openly criticize and condemn only the fanatical opinions and they're stubborn and blasphemous teachers. Again, going to the fact that there is a difference between people who misunderstand or can't understand. There's a difference between them and between people who've been shown the truth and refuse it and stick with error uh, stubbornly instead. Um, and that first group, those who simply misunderstand, that is a much, much, much bigger uh, group than the second group. The point I'm, I'm making here is that when we talk about others, you know, outside of the fellowship, uh, my intention is not to um, condemn people who are simply mistaken, uh, but rather to, to phrase everything, hopefully in the context, hopefully it's received this way, in the context of, hey, we need to help them, like that. You see the difference? Whereas with blatant, stubborn, false teachers, yeah, you know, yeah, body slam. <laughs> but because why? Because it's the application of the law to break a stone heart. That's it. You know, to break the stubbornness and, and, and get them awakened to the truth. Uh, that's the point. Everything is always about bringing somebody back to the truth. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so Arianism reduces Christ's deity. And that still happens today. And that's why it's such a big deal, again, don't practice open communion. Not everybody believes the same about what that is. People can definitely commune to their uh, spiritual harm. And it's not good pastoral practice. 
um, to just do that, to just, you know, um, place people in that position. So now you'll never get that perfect. So you do the best that you can and rely on grace um, for the rest. Yeah. I have a question about what, what if yeah. I just won't even talk to you about it? Just, you know. Yeah. Um, so, and, and some have been that, a few have been that way over the years. Uh, you know, I've had that stray person who comes in and they're looking to be offended anyway. And they kind of, they want to huff and puff and they want to stubbornly not talk to you about the differences, not acknowledge their differences, not, and not even acknowledge that you have the authority to say yes or no to their communing. And, um, you know, you do the best you can, but there's a point at which, you know, hey, the Lord be with you. Um, and give the Holy Spirit uh, ground and time to, to work that out, hopefully in their heart, if you know, if they're a believer. So, man, yeah, it happens. Yeah. I mean, when when we die, we're our yeah. souls, our souls separated from our body. Yeah. I mean, was that true of Jesus also? I mean, his earthly body was. I mean, he would. Be, so that's death. That's yeah. death. But, I mean, yeah. he was raised from the dead. Yeah. A, a, a new creation, a, a new body. Yeah, so First Peter 3 says uh, that he was made alive in the spirit in which he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Okay. Yeah. So in a sense, similar. I mean, yeah. Except God, he's God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's true at the same time to say that God cannot die and God died on the cross. Both are true at the same time. Not just his body, which is a headbender, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is like eat. But uh, just well, so is the Trinity. At some point, where the Trinity, we start. You think about it enough, you need etc. You know. Kind of, um, <laughs> but those that struggle with the presence in communion, uh -huh. are they they're not acknowledging the spiritual body. I mean, it would seem that that he. Right? Well, they're not acknowledging his deity. His deity, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Um, in in some somewhere in their theology, um, they're they're not fully um, convinced. They don't fully believe in, in the divinity of Christ. Or it would be easy to say, "Oh, well, yeah, he's God. Of course, he can be there." But to, but to say, "No, he can't," then now the, the error then is in some some nuance or, or maybe more than a nuance with regard to Christ's divinity. He's not really. God. You know, we're, we're hyper-emphasizing his humanity to the point where it blocks him being present in communion. What? He can't be in two places at once. Yeah. Of course he can. He can be anywhere he wants, as often right. as he wants, or not at all, if he wants. He's God. Right, so, right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Well, right. what I was at, I guess what I was asking yeah. is, our, our body returns to the dust. Yep. And we are given a new body. Yep. And... We're not well, we're raised. We're raised new somehow. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's like the seed um, seed metaphor Paul runs with, right? Yeah, it's you know it's buried and it comes up with this new thing. Yeah, right. Yes. So yeah, Christ was raised in his. In fact, um, remember that uh, Martha didn't even recognize him. Right. Oh, sir, tell me where you placed the body so I can go get it. Martha. You know, Martha. Mary. 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 Whoa. <laughs> Mary. Mary. And then she recognizes him. Uh, in that new body, you know, he can show up in a locked room. Uh, he can uh, eat fish on, at the you know at the uh, at the at the uh, lakeside grill. But in front of Thomas, he still had the holes and the nail prints. And in front of Thomas, he still had the nail prints. Yeah, sure, Thomas, go ahead. Yeah, here, buddy. So did he get a new body, or was that just? A <laughs> and you, you know, can you imagine being Thomas? You know, the ultimate in humiliation, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm this rock star apostle. I'll believe when I can put my fingers in it. He shows up, you know. Yeah, okay, Thomas. <laughs> yeah, that's a big, big dose of humble pie right there. Pastor, with respect to what you've, what you've read there in the foreword about, um, you know, not, not being there to, to bang on other people in, in yeah. ignorance, um, what, what would you say about our ability to consider fellowship with the broader spectrum of Christianity, people who yeah. really do believe in in yeah. Christ, but who do not share our actual confession of faith. Yeah. Um, so what is uh, yeah brings up an important how how can we work with and, and, and do things with and so forth? Yeah, uh, other denominations. So with regard to humanitarian concerns, we can work with other groups um, because we're taking care of basic human needs. It's uh, part of our calling as Christians, etc. This is what we do. 
Um, however, at the point where it involves any indoctrination, uh, any kind of uh, evangelism or getting a message out, etc., any possible confusion of the gospel, we step back. Either or or back up. Either we have to be the ones doing that, or we step back. Okay. So, for example, let's say we we go to Haiti, and somebody comes along with us, and they're um, pick one, uh, Methodist, whatever. Okay. They come help us feed the kids. They don't teach Bible study. They don't lead public anything. We do. But they can come with us and, and see the witness and hear the good news and, and learn why the differences are important and why it's meaningful and beautiful even to them and why we'd love them to be a part of that. Yeah. And more broadly speaking, I mean, would we consider them to be brothers and sisters in Christ? Or would we say, well, let's keep no, it at arm's peaceful. length here? No. No, yeah, well, I mean, I guess that's the thing. Because it depends on who we are. There's, some, there's an entire group of people, unfortunately, are from the more Lutheran than thou crowd. Yeah, yeah. well, and, and that's where we always have to, you know, simul used to set picot, or like there's always a little bit of tension there. And I was just thinking about Martin Luther when he was dealing with mm -hmm. radical reformers. Sure. And they agreed on, you know, uh, 13 out of 4. Yeah, exactly. On 13 out of 14 points of Christian doctrine, but then when they got, for example, to sacraments, yep. he was like, nope, not, on, you know, not only are we just going to agree to disagree on that, but get thee out, you know, like, <laughs> I don't want to have, you know. <laughs> yeah, like, he basically didn't want to have anything to do with them. So in the formula of Concord, Solid Declaration 7 on the Lord's Supper, the quote from Luther there says, well, here, ha, we've got the book in front of us. Ha -ha. I knew there was a reason why I wanted you to bring it. Uh, let's look at that. Formula of Concord, Solid Declaration. Um, oh, we need to look at that too. Uh, look at seven. Uh, and the page where the quote is. Is page 568 in the reader's edition. Uh, this is right after quoting Luther on what I call both the validity and the efficacy of the sacrament. What makes the Lord's Supper, the, the Lord's Supper, validity and efficacy? Um, Luther is quoted with regard to the sacramentarians, saying, um, I regard them as all being cut from the same piece of cloth. Do you see that in the right-hand column on 568? The indented <coughs> portion there under, th uh, there, the section number is 33, and then the indented quote there on the right-hand column. I regard them... All is being cut from the same piece of cloth, as indeed they are, for they do not want to believe that the Lord's bread in the supper is his true natural body, which the godless person or Judas receives orally, just as well as St. Peter and all the saints. Whoever I say does not want to believe that, let him not trouble me with letters, writings, or words, and let him not expect to have fellowship with me. This is final. Well, that's pretty straightforward. Um, and then um, this kind of uh, thing... Uh, comes up again in um, the large catechism uh, with regard to uh, baptism. Um, page through small catechism, large catechism, baptism. Um, oh, that's the preface. This is really important. It's going to be super fun to watch at home. Sorry about that, guys. Um, but this is really, really an important thing. Oops, the creed. <coughs> there we go. Baptism. All right. Um, on page 424. Uh, look at where it says number 15 in the right-hand column, okay. in the reader's edition. It is pure wickedness and blasphemy of the devil when our new spirits mock baptism, leaving God's word and institution out of it. Okay. Um, look at, um, he calls them, on page 426 in, in a paragraph or section, whatever, 429, he calls them a blind guides. 
um, in 30. Now these new spirits are so crazy that they separate faith and the object to which faith clings and is bound, even if it is something um, outward. Um, Uh, on page 428, look at 47 under infant baptism. Here a question arises by which the devil through his sects confused the world, infant baptism. He calls those sectarians of the devil. They're the devil's <laughs> sects. S-E-C-T-S. Uh, and this, this kind of language um, continues. I was looking for something even more blunt because they're here. They are on uh, page 429, number 50. They are arrogant, clumsy minds that draw together such ideas and conclusions as these. Where there is not the true faith, there cannot be true baptism. Um, you get the idea. So, so there are some clear areas there where I guess to, yeah. to, to put it kindly, you know, we, we won't, we, we aren't really at liberty to concede things. Right. Um, and, and furthermore, there is maybe an assertion here that there may be even a, a lack of, you know, Christian doctrine in, in some of those things, which we still have today. There are still people today who will argue against infant baptism, usually people who misunderstand the, the concept yeah. and the gift of baptism. Yeah. And so I guess the, the question is, I mean, Martin Luther at least was pretty inclined to not call them Christians. Yes, um, and that's right. And today said, we... He says they're not. Yeah, <coughs> and, and yeah. today we probably don't, just out of courtesy, but... Uh, so I guess that's sort of the thrust of my question is, you yeah. know. It's not because Luther was too hard-nosed, but because we are too soft today that we look at these kinds of statements and, <gasps> you know, and, I, and I've had people just kind of straight up say, how, how dare you talk like what we know is right and what somebody else believes is wrong. Well, because Bible, you know, so. So early we were talking about Heretics, teachers, yeah. and yeah. also those are, that are in error. I mean, yeah. would he leave? Would he leave any room for those in error to be corrected? Or sure, okay. Yeah, that's why. That's why the introduction opens like that. It's not our play. It's not our desire to condemn those who simply misunderstand, um, but rather we're going after the two things: <clears throat> the blasphemous concepts themselves. <clears throat> And that's really what we want to be talking about at the concepts more than the people. But those fanatics who refuse correction, yeah, we're and talking about them too. And that seems to be who he's speaking to. The, oh, sure. Yeah not, yeah. not those that are ignorant or in error. Or, sure. I mean, so when he says the sects, S-E-C-T-S, are from the devil, he's talking about the people leading them, inventing them, you know, the radical sectarians, yeah. Because yeah. ultimately it's dangerous for their people that they are yeah. being led to put their faith in something other than what Scripture is yeah, saying. Yeah, and the point, again, the point always is to draw them to repentance and faith. Always. The point of that is not just to label them something and blast them, but to call... Well, same thing uh, when Paul says, put, put the offender out of the congregation, resign him to the devil to, so, that, so that he may learn, you know, kind of the error of his ways. Okay, now receive him back. He's repented. Don't be too hard on him. The point is always repentance. Yeah. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that purpose, that reason for, for doing that, is the reason why we continue and, and the world persists to this day, is for the benefit of those who could still be saved. And it's, yeah. it's given to us as Christians to, to do that for them. Yeah. Absolutely. Because it was done for us. Yeah. Abs absolutely. Um, on 491, to wrap up because it's time. Um, the Council of Nicaea in 325 was called by Constantine to address the Arian error. And it's really interesting um, because it's not all super clear cut. Um, uh, uh, you know what? That's too much story for right now. We will get to that next time. Um, but he did call the council. It was to address the Arian question. It was to unify the empire. And the ultimate uh, resolution uh, was expressed in the Nicene Creed to which... Uh, a lot of guys signed on, some of them with some reservations, and that became the full expression of uh, what is believed and taught. And Arianism and its teachings were condemned as anathema, or they were cursed, uh, if you were there under the, under the curse. So Nicaea is the first ecumenical council because representatives of the entire Christian church were present. 
Um, at Constantinople in 381 AD, uh, the Nicene Creed was reaffirmed. Um, and uh, the third article was lengthened to the form that we know today. Um, it was um, strengthened at a local regional council in Toledo, Spain. Toledo, Spain. Uh, later, and the filioque was added that the Son is, um, excuse me, the Spirit is sent from the Father and the Son. And the Eastern Church had took, took issue with that because of their philosophy underlying their theology, but also because it was a regional council, a local council, and not an ecumenical council. Uh, that's more of a cover for the other thing. Um, but it's a, good, it's a good example, though, of how when you start to define things and look at what Scripture says, you start to cleave people off who don't want to believe that. Yeah, and we, and, uh, and, and we talked about the filioque back in uh, the section on the creeds. And then the Athanasian creed, which probably wasn't necessarily written by Athanasius, um, but rather was named probably for him. Um, the earliest copies are from the 6th century, uh, found in southern France. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, they're in Latin. Uh, they close the loophole, holes, basically. They close up any loophole that any heretic tried to exploit prior to that formulation that slams the door on it. It's, you, you, the Athanasian Creed pretty much just nails it all down. Look, this is what Christian faith is. Um, and we'll, we'll stop there. We'll start on page 493 with the Augsburg Confession and the Apology um, next time on 493. Thank you so much. Sorry, we ran five minutes over, uh, but with good cause. They're good questions. Yeah. All right, let's close with prayer. Uh, actually, let's pray in the words our Savior taught us. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Peace be with you. And also with you.